and be believed in. So Pastor Caleb, I honor you. Okay. So if you have your Bibles, you can go to Mark 13, 28 through 37. I'll get there in just a second, but um, people like me, I want to be prepared and ahead. And so when we get to Mark 13, I want you to go ahead and be able to be there um, verses 28 through 37. And I'm going to sit down today because uh, honestly, sometimes I get too sped up and sometimes I speak too loud um, and start yelling and um, we don't have to yell all the time, right? Um, I yelled a few times at the TV um, this weekend uh, or Thursday night. Um, I grew up in a family that loved North Carolina Tar Heels. And so that means during football season, I am in seasonal depression. Um, we, we, we still won a game and I went to sleep frustrated. That's how you know it was bad. Um, so I'm in for another average season. Uh, we love average around here. Okay, I'll wait for basketball season as Brad says to me every day as he, you know, roots for Georgia. Uh-huh. I wish I had all that NIL money. Okay, <clears throat> you know, we're just an academic school. Okay, so <laughs> we've been talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place in the year 70 AD, okay? So those of you who are learners, um, that was 40 years or so after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And uh, in particular, we've been looking at the Olivet Discourse uh, where Jesus sits on the Mount of Olives and predicts that um, in the generation of the disciples, the temple would be destroyed. And something Pastor Caleb has taught us, uh, I mean, some of you incredibly smart people, one day I'll get there, um, uh, knew this, that where Jesus was sitting, you could actually see the entire city as he was prophesying that. And so I just honestly love how detailed and strategic Jesus is. Sometimes we don't believe he is. Um, and he, uh, God is so strategic and detailed and I love it. So uh, what we've been trying to show you uh, by preaching the Olivet Discourse is that um, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem was actually the vindication of Jesus Christ and his ministry, okay? Um, and it actually was a testament of his authority as he now sits at the right hand of God. And it was actually the fulfillment of prophecy. So Jesus' prophecy to the disciples came to pass. And um, something I loved um, learning this week as Pastor Caleb was walking us through this text as I was prepared to preach here at Hilton Head was there was this really, um, really smart guy named Tertullian. Um, and I added that to my baby name list if we have another one. Um, he, um, he would actually write and argue to Rome and uh, it was actually called an apology, but it doesn't mean for uh, forgiveness. It means like apologetics, like an argument. And he, he originally was arguing that Christians are the best citizens. Um, and I actually sat there and began to repent to the Lord. And I was like, I don't know if people would say that about me. I don't know if people would even say that about the church today, that Christians are the best citizens, but that's what Tertullian was arguing to Rome. So whoever he was around was some pretty amazing uh, people. And uh, he actually argued that their theology and doctrine was more beautiful than Rome. And so Rome was the Mecca. So he was setting, you know, Christ and Christians above even that. And so I thought that was a really amazing too. And he was always arguing that it leads to greater transformation. And I don't know about you, but my life has been transformed by submitting my life to Christ and not just believing he's my savior, but allowing him to be my Lord. Um, and so I really thought that that was beautiful. And then he took it a step further and, um, and he actually argued against Rome that um, they need to stop taking credit for the destruction of Jerusalem because Jesus prophesied it. Okay, so he said, stop acting like you conquered the God of the scriptures. And uh, so I wanna encourage somebody that God will never be conquered by anything. He's already conquered death, hell, and the grave. And so any man-made power or any um, even antichrist spirit, nothing will conquer God. He will never be dethroned. And so I thought it was really powerful that you have a guy named Tertullian who was arguing on behalf of the Christians um, as early as um, like uh, 195, um, uh, what was that, AD or BC? So I can't even remember. Um, so yeah, I'll get there one day. I'll, I'll be smart one day, I promise. So we have a quote from Tertullian and we're gonna read it. So it says, uh, therefore, since the prophecy came true that the stones of the temple would be cast down and the whole city destroyed by the hands of the Romans, you ought to acknowledge that it was the work of God himself announced by Christ as a punishment rather than a victory achieved by the Romans. So the fall of Jerusalem wasn't Rome's victory. Although God used Rome to be victorious over Jerusalem, it was actually judgment from God after the crucifixion of Jesus. So now we're going to turn to the, um, to the latter half of the Olivet Discourse and where he um, is uh, walking them through the lesson of the fig tree and then talking about the imminent return um, of Christ to bring justice and redemption to all um, creation. So 
If you turn there earlier, um, gold star, if you need to turn there now, uh, Mark 13, 28 through 37, I'm gonna one day learn how to be really skilled and open a water bottle while I'm preaching because you'll notice the whole time I'm struggling to get it open. So verse 28 is gonna be on the screens. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and put out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not, you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, uh, each uh, with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore stay awake for you do not know when the master of the house will come in, uh, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows are in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Uh, I'm gonna pray really quick and then we're gonna dive in. Uh, God, we just honor you. Uh, we humble ourselves today as learners of your word. God, I pray that um, you would use me to walk uh, in this text with the body, Father God, as we are learning um, what you want us to learn and you are allowing the scriptures to preach to our soul so that we can have even greater transformation because that's what your word always has done and always will do in Jesus' name, amen. So uh, this is Passover week and um, Jesus is approaching the time of his crucifixion. And um, we wanna remember something uh, at the triumphal entry when Jesus was coming into uh, the city, they celebrated him as the coming conqueror of Rome, who was the oppressor of the Jews. And I, I thought about this, uh, it was crazy to think that they didn't even know that Jesus was the conqueror of the oppression of their souls. They just wanted the earthly uh, oppression to be done with, right? They didn't want to deal with the oppression of their souls. And I think we can fall into that trap sometimes that God just wants to give us that, or we just need God to give us that, or give us this, or even give us this breakthrough here on the earth. But Jesus always has been, always will be the conqueror of the oppression of our souls. And it's crazy that you can be, they could be so close to Jesus, but miss the whole point of why he was on um, uh, earth. And, Jesus didn't come to fight with Rome, but he walked straight to the temple and begins to overturn tables. I don't know about you, but I would've got fired up in that moment. I get passionate about anything. Um, I wanna argue about everything. And so I'm like, yeah, we're flipping tables, let's go. Um, and uh, he was saying that uh, this was supposed to be a house uh, of prayer, right? For the nations. And yet it became a den of robbers. And that's where you see that he actually cursed the fig tree, not the same one that's in the text, but earlier uh, he curses a fig tree because it b uh, bore no fruit. And he related that to the temple and said, this is supposed to bring fruit. And yet it leaves you empty. And that's what was happening um, in, in that day. And you see him actually um, <clears throat> go into the temple, right? With the Jewish scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, um, and, and he actually humiliated them um, on something that they were supposed to be experts um, on. That's something I, I've always loved about um, Jesus is he was such a savage, but he did it so kindly. Um, um, sometimes I see that quality in Pastor Caleb. He can be such a savage, but it's so kind. And I'm like, how do you speak that way? Um, so uh, you see him exit the temple for the last time uh, before he's um, uh, gonna be crucified. And uh, what I love is you can see the correlation there to Ichabod, right? That the glory has departed. And you actually see that the incarnate son of God actually departed the temple. So you saw the glory um, actually leave the temple. And that's when he says the disciples, not one stone uh, will be left upon another. And, um, and, and, other words, that means that uh, uh, Jerusalem is gonna fall, that the temple is gonna fall. And as he's seated on the Mount of Olives, the disciples asked him, when will these things happen? And so that's when he launched into the Olivet Discourse and begins to prophesy that there would be uh, wars and rumors of wars and false messiahs and that the disciples, um, they would be drugged before synagogues and beaten for their testimonies, that they would be brought before political leaders and have to testify about Jesus. And so um, uh, people can read this verse and think that this always means about the end of all things. And that's not actually true as Pastor Caleb and myself have argued the partial preterist um, um, uh, doctrinal point throughout this text. And 
And so we find contextually that, um, that what happened here uh, was actually in the disciples' time. So this wasn't speaking about um, a forthright coming until he gets to the imminent return of Christ. This was actually something that was going to happen and did happen in the life of the disciples. And you see that about um, 30 or 40 uh, years later. And so you actually see Jerusalem fall. And I know that this is like honestly um, life-changing and riveting. Um, uh, and I know that I am um, honestly just a great communicator. And I'm so glad that you come to listen to this. And so... Uh, <laughs> And so you see Jerusalem fall, right? And uh, in AD 70, during the Roman Jewish war, Jerusalem was absolutely annihilated off the face of the earth, like Jesus said. And uh, you actually see some pretty cool accounts from Josephus. Um, and he's the one that um, told us through his writings that 1.1 million Jews were actually destroyed at this time. Um, I was talking to my brother um, as we were going to get some Taco Bell. I know that, um, you know, we'll pay for that later, but yeah, here we are. And we were talking about that and my brother was like, ah, I never knew that. And I was like, ah, I didn't either. Um, until Pastor Caleb had um, exposed all of us to Josephus like he um, you know, so joyfully does uh, every week. And so um, the 1.1 million Jews that died um, was all because they fled to take refuge in the city, the exact opposite thing that Jesus um, uh, prophesied to the disciples. So Jesus was having a conversation and telling them that, hey, when you see the certain signs start happening, you don't need to flee to the city. You need to flee to the mountains, right? And so that's where you actually see the flight to Pella um, take place, right? And so um, the Christians, they started seeing certain signs and um, the text was um, actually telling them like, flee your houses, don't go back for your things. You can see like a correlation there with Lot and his wife as she looked back and one of the things that she had um, grown up with and built a life with and you saw her turn to Saul. And, um, and one of the things that I think is so funny, it says, pray you're not pregnant um, when you have to run. So uh, I just imagine like a pregnant lady absolutely haul and tail and uh, it, probably pretty rough for her as she's having to go up um, a mountain because it's tough for my Prius. So I can't imagine what it would be like for, um, for a pregnant lady. Pregnant ladies, we honor you. Uh, I'm just glad I don't have to do it. Amen. So I want to tell you some uh, two quick stories here um, about fleeing, just so we can kind of put in perspective what the Christians did um, when they had to flee. So uh, the first one um, was back in high school when I was like um, trying to go on a few dates with this one girl to see if it, it would lead anywhere. And um, it was fall time uh, at this point. And you know, fall time, teenagers, we want to go to like the haunted mazes or the cornfields or, um, you know what I mean? Go out and just hang out with our friends. And so a couple of friends wanted to go out to this place that had like a haunted house slash um, uh, cornfield or whatever. And listen, man, I don't do scary. Like I don't, you can come around the corner and jump and I'll be jumping six feet. Like I just, I'm like, ah, you know, I get real spooked. And, and so, uh, we, we go there and we do this like haunted hayride first. And you know, that was fun, but I'm like over there, like clench, but not trying to clench her hand. Right. Do you know what I mean? To, to hurt her hand. But I'm over here like, oh, can we get this over with him? And, and then we go to the next thing and I can't remember what it was. I think it was like corn maze or something that you walk through. I don't know why we pay for this stuff, but we're just trying to find something to do. Right. Other than get in trouble. And so, have the haunted house. And she's like, Hey, let's go in the haunted house with some friends. And I'm like, oh, all right, let's do it. And so we're walking through the haunted house and uh, I'm really proud of myself because uh, I make it like pretty much out of the house with my chest puffed up. Like, you know, that didn't scare me. You know what I mean? And uh, we get all the way to the end. We have like one more turn left. And this man comes out um, of the cornfield with a chainsaw and, uh, I wish I could tell you that I scooped her up in my arms and ran out, uh, but I pushed her slam into the man with the chainsaw and ran out that thing. <laughs> and she never talked to me after that. And I honestly don't, don't blame her. Um, and then uh, as I started dating my wife, who I'm now married to, amen, um, we, um, you know, we were trying to find things to do because um, when you try to find things to do, you can stay out of trouble, amen, before you're married. So we were trying to uh, find all these things to do and we found this like bull run hike. Those of you that love hiking, you would laugh at this. It's literally just a flat trail with leaves. Do you know what I mean? Um, but it was this place called Bull Run and we loved to go there because honestly, we got to like get away from um, uh, the busyness of life and just talk and dream. And I thought it was cool um, that I was sitting here in my office thinking as I was studying this about, the things that we had dreamed of, we're now living in. And so um, don't be afraid to dream, young people, because um, if it honors God, God will um, see it come to pass. And so we're walking through these trails and, um, you know, it, we had been there a couple of times and we had come upon where this snake was coiled up on the trail. And again, you're seeing a pattern in my life. Like, I wish I scooped her up 
and ran. Uh, no, I put my hand on her and I, and I, and I stepped forward and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not a slow white guy. And so I took off running, left her in the dust, left her there with the snake. And, um, uh, I need help. I know it's a pattern. I'm trying to get braver. Okay. Um, but I can just imagine in those moments, uh, that's how the Christians were fleeing uh, to Pella because they knew, they understood the prophecy of Jesus was not a joke and that Jerusalem would be, would be annihilated. And if they went to hide in the city, they too would be, um, would be annihilated. So, um, we actually moved to, um, we actually moved to, uh, uh, a, a, um, uh, quote from Josephus in just a second about something that he witnessed or, um, uh, witnesses did, uh, account for. And he wrote about it. Um, before that we get to the part where we learn the lesson of the fig tree. And so the fig trees were one of the only tree, trees in the geographic region that loses its leaves in the winter. And uh, when the warm weather comes, anybody, some warm weather lovers um, that just love, well, that's everyone. We live here. Okay. Um, and uh, it begins to bear fruit again. And remember, he just said, when you see the abomination of desolation, then run. And so he was correlating the fig tree with all the signs that they would see. Remember, we had to, they had to watch for like signs in the sky. And then they had to watch for some like prophetic signs and some other things. And when they saw those things, they had um, to flee. And this is the account from Josephus that, um, that he wrote about. And I think we have it on the screen. It says, and these men told me that they saw such a strange sight as I shall now relate. They said that the eastern gate of the inner court of the temple, which was of brass and vastly heavy and had been with difficulty shut by 20 men and rested upon a basis armed with iron and had bolts fastened very deep into the firm floor, which was there made of a one entire stone, was seen to be open of its own accord about the sixth hour of the night. Now those that kept watching the temple came here upon running to the captain of the temple and told him of it, who then came up uh, thither and not without great difficulty was able to shut the gate. Um, Again, so all around Jerusalem, there was this story being told about the gate that needed to be closed by 20 men and opened by 20 men, miraculously being opened by itself. Can we say God intervened, right? And so the Jews actually saw this as a sign of blessing. They don't know how to read a room, right? Okay, and, um, and so they saw that as a sign of blessing. What did the Christians know? They said, oh my Lord, if a, if a gate that needs to be closed and open by 20 men opens miraculously, I know that Jerusalem is about to be destroyed. And if I want to be saved, I got to flee to the mountains. And, and so I thought that that was um, honestly a really cool account. I love um, learning about early church history and about the things that honestly prove, um, uh, you know, Jesus um, in and of itself and all the things that he said would come true. I don't know about you, but um, it's just really a fascinating thing to encounter and all the, um, the writings that we have that reign true today. So when Jesus says, you see the signs, remember the fig tree and run, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So this is where we can kind of get some of that weird theology that so many of us have believed because we watched all the Left Behind movies and we fell in love with him. So um, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So we have a prophecy from Jesus that will take place during this generation. And so this is where some people can kind of do gymnastics to make this mean that the last generation um, won't pass away until all of these things happen. But the language and context is, is clear that um, uh, Jesus was saying that this was gonna happen when you are alive. And as Pastor Caleb has argued to us so that we can become more and more theologically and doctrinally sound, we are not drugged before synagogues, Right? Okay, sure, maybe some people get to testify in front of political leaders about Jesus, um, but we are not drugged in front of synagogues um, and beaten for our faith, okay? We get to wake up and go to Starbucks and pay $8 for a coffee and then go, you know what I mean, do our job. So we're not in the same boat uh, as, these, as these disciples. And Jerusalem was destroyed uh, in this generation. So um, one of the things we want you to take away, and I love how Pastor Caleb honestly has taught, has begun to taught me how to write sermons as we're looking historically and then diving it into the text. And we'll, we'll turn shortly about uh, where I get to honestly start preaching and put my foot on the gas here. But I really wanted to sit down and calmly just walk you through this text as we're learning about um, some, uh, some doctrinal things that maybe we have never heard before because the pulpit of before could have just consisted of hellfire and brimstone and not some sound theological um, teaching. So um, I thought that that is 
has been really cool as Pastor Caleb um, in, in how God has even used me to walk us through um, this word so far. And so the one things, uh, one of the things we want you to take away in this context is that you see that Jesus loves his church. Can we agree with that? That Jesus loves his church and that Jesus is coming back for his church. And you see that Jesus protects his church when they lean in and listen to his instruction, right? I don't know about you, but I can be a little hard-headed and be, um, you know what I mean, a little bit like um, outside the box and kind of push the, the envelope and, and, you know, go across the line or whatever. But, but the church had to listen to Jesus's instructions in order to be saved. And, and so what we can take from this is that the church can thrive in the face of oppression. And we know the closer we get to the imminent return of Christ, the more and more persecution the church in America is gonna face. And one of those reasons is because we've become so apathetic and we don't wanna lean into the things that culture is telling the young people that they can lean into and become and do. And all that is gonna come to pass 30 years from now while we sit idly by believing that it's not that important. And so the devil is just pouring in more and more um, confusion into the lives of young people. And you're gonna see the church of um, apathy come into the church of confusion um, later on, and they're not even going to know what um, uh, to believe. But we know that if we lean into the hard things, and we can even see the oppression of even sexuality uh, today in the lives of people, this is not just young people, this is people walking in confusion, right? Because they're beginning to serve their own flesh. But if you lean into Jesus's instructions about how you're supposed to live and submit your life each and every day, you will be protected in the days of oppression that you may face. We will not be able to avoid persecution, but when we find ourselves oppressed, even by spiritual warfare, um, we, are, we know we are protected by God. And so um, two things is that fear is not our response to hard seasons. Okay, I don't know about you, but sometimes I can be more afraid of the things that aren't of God than of God, right? And so I know that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And so I can have a healthy fear of the Lord and not fear the things that life may bring. And so what we can take away from this is that we do not have to fear in response to hard seasons. And some of you are walking through hard seasons and you're probably doing it quietly because you don't know how the church is gonna respond or how people beside you are gonna respond. And I want you to know that this is a safe place for you to open your mouth and say, I'm hurting, I'm broken, my marriage is broken, my finances are broken, my soul is broken, and I need God to transform me. And you are safe in the house of the Lord. So fear, do not be afraid. Do not let the devil um, uh, hold you back from transformation that you um, can have so freely. And so leaning into the faithfulness of Jesus. Um, and that's something that I'm learning every single day is to lean into the faithfulness of Jesus. And so then he turns to the disciples and says, but concerning that day or hour, no one knows. And so up until this point, he was talking about the generation he was looking at, right? So the disciples, and now he speaks future tense to us. Somebody say us, amen. Okay, so you see the subject has now changed, okay? And again, he's talking about us. Concerning that day, no one knows the hour, no one knows the minute, no one knows the, the month, no one knows the year, none of it, right? And so Jesus walks the disciples through that, and then he states something so powerful. Not even himself knows the day or the hour. Do you know the lesson that I learned from that? That Jesus is so humble, he will not use his fully God in a moment where he submits to be fully human. And he lives in being the incarnate son of God in that moment. And so if we wanna take anything from that, we need to take the humility, the lessons of being submitted, right? Our life fully at the feet of Jesus and saying, carve the things out of me that are not of you so that I can be full of your love and your grace and your peace and your truth each and every day that I wake up and wherever um, I, I walk. And so we call this the imminent return of Christ. And we can see that beautiful picture that even Jesus himself uh, did not know um, when God would return. And so for those of you who might be newer to the faith or even newer to this um, um, you know, discussion, uh, we don't need you to have an end times calendar, okay? We don't need you to um, teach the book of Revelation. Call Pastor Jim, okay? Just sit under good teaching and learn what you need to learn and put your hand to the plow and do the work of the ministry. So uh, we need to remember that it could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be next week. It could be the next time I'm watching Carolina lose in Jesus' name. Um, we, have to we have to ask ourselves, are you ready if he comes back today? 
Are we ready in our soul and in our mind? And does our life reflect our readiness? These are things that we can actually do once we leave church. And we can actually take a look and examine our life and say, am I ready if Christ returned tomorrow? Is my soul ready? Is my mind ready? Is my heart ready? Jesus gives an analogy of what it will be like. It says the master is leaving, but gives responsibility to the servants. They will not know when he returns, but should be obedient and attentive. So the master leaves the service in charge of everything and leaves on a trip. They don't know when he'll return. Sometimes I think that we can sit idly by and just be, I'm, I'm just waiting for him to return. I'm just waiting for him to return, right? But we find ourselves um, in a bad situation if we're just waiting for him to return and not doing the work of the master. You know, James says, faith without works is dead, amen? So one of the things we're supposed to have is an enduring alertness. Everybody say alertness. It could be in the evening. It could be in the morning. It could be at midnight. Um, it could be at 5 a.m., I know some of us have a hard time getting up at 5 a.m. Um, and so we do not know when Jesus is coming back. And so we have to vigilantly fight sleepiness. We cannot let life lull us to sleep. Sometimes our everyday routines, our Keurig hitting at 6 a.m., the same clothes I've been wearing for three years, do you know what I mean? The same car I've been driving. I get in, I go to my office, I make the emails, I, or I send the emails, I make the calls, I get the sales. I'm asleep. Man, you know, I don't know if I feel Christ. Ugh, a statement in and of itself, but that's where we find ourselves. I don't know if I feel Christ in my today. I don't know if I felt Christ in my month or whatever, right? But we lull ourselves to sleep. My life, I've been really repentant of doing ministry without God, right? I found myself doing ministry, needing God's affirmation from all the work that my hand has done, right? When God said, I just wanted to do it with you the whole time. So we cannot be asleep when Christ returns. Christ is very clear about those who are asleep when he returns are not gonna wake up. <laughs> those who are awake are gonna go with Christ, but those who have been lulled to sleep by life, right? We always wanna think as the devil as some like massive, like heroic Olympian gold medalist winner in our life. No, he wants to lull you to sleep little by little, day by day, stripping your conviction and actually getting you to be less holy than you've ever been before. Because when we're less holy, we're more sleepy, right? Because all sin does is kill us. And so sleepiness means we're teetering on death. But when we're awake, our soul is alive, right? Our heart is alive. Our mind is alive. And so we have to fight sleepiness. But you know, just proximity is not good enough for us to fight sleepiness. Look at the disciples. They couldn't have been closer to Jesus and they fell asleep, right? Peter fell asleep both times he had an opportunity to stay awake. And boy, we love Peter. One of the most passionate, right, and impulsive people um, in the Bible. And if you turn to 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11, it says this. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Christ Jesus. When you're lulled to sleep, God's not getting the glory from your life, right? When we are letting God have the glory in our life, we can run and not grow weary. That is God's word. He is not gonna do something opposite of his word right? And you know how you grow, like um, you don't grow weary in doing good? That's if God's getting the glory from your life. But if you're being lulled to sleep, right? Because you're not having uh, clear, honest conversations in your marriage, or you are not being honest about what God's pounding on your chest about serving God's church, maybe for the first time ever, and not just attending, right? These are these moments where God begins to get the glory um, in our life. And you can actually look at the parable of the virgins, right? 10 go out. Five run out of oil, five do not. Guess who are rewarded? The five who do not run out of oil. How do you not run out of oil? You stay awake in prayer and intercession, right? You don't just be proud that you know God's word, but you get at his feet and you say, humble me, Holy Spirit. My life must glorify you. If I don't look like Christ, who do I look like? 
That's how you stay oily. That's how you never let the lamp run out. That's how you don't catch yourself sleeping in the midst of a reward. We have to stay awake by being committed to prayer and intercession. A a prayerless church is a sleep period. This is not a house that doesn't honor prayer. We have prayer seven days a week. It requires discipline, devotion, and commitment. The thing that Pastor Caleb and I are challenging you of is give us one time a week that you are making the commitment to get up early if you're at Hilton Head and get in the room. Go at night if you're at Bluffton, get in the room. Get before Jesus and pray for something other than yourself. That's what the prayer room is about. It's not about God, me praying about everything I need. God knows everything I need. The Bible says the spirit is always praying on my behalf. He's not unaware of what I need. But there is something that happens in the life of a believer when we get up and we begin to pray for children. We begin to pray for teenagers. We begin to pray for the lost adults, right? We begin to pray for the broken marriages that are in our neighborhoods, our broken coworkers. We fix our eyes off ourselves and get them on the things that Christ loved, which is people. You have seven opportunities a week to get into the prayer room for one hour. We honor our time. We do not go over. 60 minutes, get in the prayer room and get on your knees and begin to pray about something other than ourselves. When you teach kids that serving Christ costs something, they don't walk away from their faith. Teenagers walk away from their faith because their parents try to protect them from everything. Show your teenagers that serving Christ costs something and then they'll pay the cost when they get older. And they won't be looking for a youth group in the, in, the, in the facade of a young adult ministry. They'll stay in church. They'll listen to grown-up teaching. And they'll let God's word grow their heart. But we have to show them that it costs something. And you'll want to quit and you'll want to sleep. But when we stay vigilant and awake in prayer, the oil will not run out. Then there's a call to do the work of the master while he's away. You see the parable of the talents. One was given five and he doubled it. One was given two and he doubled it. One was given one and he went and hid it. And it was taken from him. And it was given to the one that had been given 10. Why? Because God honors fruitfulness just like he honors faithfulness. We have a lot of faithful Christians to Sunday mornings and to online prayers and to Wednesday nights. But we have a lot of Christians that want to eh, 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 about fruitfulness, about having to put their hand to the plow and do the work of the master. We always say, we'll just leave it up to the young people. No, as far as I read, the Old Testament used a lot of seasoned veteran saints. Why? Because they've been through life and they won't shy away when it gets hard. So you don't have an excuse to not serve God's house, even though you've got gray hairs. We still need you. My generation needs your wisdom because if we don't have wisdom, we do things that are not wise. We preach things that are not wise. We give in ways that are not wise. We cannot just leave ministry up to those that have stamina. If you've got breath in your lungs, you've got stamina to give the house of the Lord. And we have to do the work of the master. It's not, no one else is coming. There aren't believers that are waiting that will just do the work that is in Hilton Head and Bluffton that we have signed up to do because we live here. We reside here. We can't watch for signs in the way that the early church watched for. We gotta stop being caught up in the weird Facebook end times like doctrinal statements. Just stop sharing them. They're just, they're not true, okay? Stop getting caught up that if if he's coming back, it's okay. We won't be caught sleeping because we're awake. Why? Because we're building God's church. And so in our context, we disciple, we evangelize, and we build the church. That's how we stay awake. That's how we stay ready. That's how we do the work that the master said to do when he left on his trip. So as a band comes up, I'm going to end this thinking about some things. Even right at your seat, if you would just go ahead and just close your eyes. Just close your eyes and say, Holy Spirit, speak to my heart in this moment. Holy Spirit, begin to convict me in areas that I have just really not fully given over to you. Holy Spirit, heal the parts of me that are even so painful that I might have not even told my spouse sitting next to me. Holy Spirit, convict me of not, convict me of a spirit of apathy in the name of Jesus. So in this season, the master went away and we're first supposed to be awake in prayer. 
And then every believer is called to participate in discipleship of the nations, the building of the church as the master is absent. I can tell you this confidently after being here for two months, there are some phenomenal disciplers in this church and they don't always step on the stage. And so the men and women in this house that are discipling people, I wanna honor you in this moment because you are not asleep, you are awake and you understand the call of God on your life. And so if you wanna know what it looks like to be a discipler, get around those in this house that are discipling people and you'll see it firsthand. When he returns, he will examine our work to see if we've been faithful and fruitful with what he's asked us to do. And I don't know about you, but he's gonna ask us if we were faithful and fruitful in Hilton Head and in Bluffton, not from a church perspective, but from a neighbor perspective. Did your neighbors know that you, that you looked like me and served me? Did your coworkers know that you looked like me and that you served me? Right? We can get in weird positions where we have more to say about a church's vision than about Christ to our neighbors, than about Christ in our office. If the things that are on our lips are more about anything but Jesus, we've got to re-examine our heart, get at his feet and say, convict me, Father, because my whole life needs to be about you. Every single piece of me needs to be about you. So we have to ask ourselves, are we actively engaged in building the church while the master is away? Are we serving in the congregation or outside of the congregation? Are we working with kids, youth, media, photography, videography? Are we working in administration? The church does a lot of things on the backs of a little amount of people. And so whatever gifts God has given you, the church can find a way to use them. Please do not let a voice in your head tell you you're disqualified from serving the house of the Lord because you don't see these frontward ministries. Are we in a connect group? We're launching them right now. If you're not in a group, then you're probably not growing at the rate that you should be when you're connected to a body of believers that are going after the same things as the mission of your life that this area has a church, a spirit-filled, doctrinally sound. Let me tell you, they're usually either doctrinally sound with no life or spirit-filled with the weirdest theology you've ever heard in your life. But this place is doctrinally sound and spirit-filled. And that means that people's lives can be changed and stay changed. Not just an emotional moment where they say, I've got to chase that again. No, they find themselves consistently being nurtured and matured by the, by the word of God and in powerful moments of worship and in prayer. We have to ask ourselves, are we building our own life or our is our life a representation of our master? Are we trying to do these things because of the insecurities on the inside of us and build this and build that and do that and become this and look like this? Or do we just wanna look like Jesus? That is something Pastor Caleb has been just trying to instill in me because I am a very ambitious, dogmatic person, <laughs> very passionate. But he says, I think Jesus just wants to know if you'll just love him like each and every day, not be worried about if this will come or that will come or this will happen. If you will just love him. If you are in here and you are wondering if Christ loves you, I just need to remind you that he took his life on the cross and then walked out of the grave for a maybe from you. Even in the face of rejection, he still did what he did. And so our life has to look like Christ as well. And then the last thing is the, the old saying, the calendar and the wallet tell the story. Your money shows where your treasure is and your, and your calendar shows where your treasure is. If you're too busy to pray, then you're probably too busy to grow. Next year, you'll be, you'll be praying about the same things, frustrated about the same things. But when we align our, our life with the building of the church, with evangelism and discipleship, we will find God grow our life in an exponential way. Why? Because that's how he is. That's who he will always be. And so as you stand up, and as the 